Hi everybody, so technical difficulties uh, are now complete. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the sixth installment of the Visual Cultures Public Program Living Extinctions that is also generously supported by the Critical Ecologies Research Stream. Um, most of you have been coming to the series, so I won't give a big preamble uh, about uh, our theme, just to say that it is on this uh, urgent question of uh, extinction or annihilation and climate crisis and how cultural production um, can affect or inform or be affected by uh, these kinds of geopolitical urgencies today. Um, because I want to do a thorough and, and appropriate introduction for our guest, I'll just launch into that and then hand it over to him. But before I uh, do that, uh, just to ask if you do need to leave uh, before we move into the second half of question and answer, uh, if you could just do that discreetly um, after the talk, we'll, we'll give some time to switch gears in the room. Okay, so uh, for the last uh, 20 years, the collaborative artist team, Sneedwan's daughter Wilson, has been practicing and producing in the field of contemporary art on the international stage, with projects and exhibitions in the UK, Europe, Australia, and the US. They've built a reputation resonant in many fields, uh, not least contemporary art, animal studies, human geography, museology, uh, the environmental sciences, and, and more. So in this respect, it's been their strategic intent to drive the idea that contemporary art is a significant voice made possible by the application of unique blends of original methods and cross-disciplinary appropriation. Sneeborn's daughter Wilson's artwork is multidisciplinary in nature, most usually taking the form of installation involving anything from sculpt sculptural interventions, found objects and materials, video, audio, drawing, photography, and texts. Notwithstanding their participation in international biennales and major gallery shows, their adherence to the significance and advantage of site specificity has often led them strategically to exhibit in some tiny and otherwise most obscure venues. The production of their work is unashamedly driven and facilitated by intensive research and interdisciplinary associations because as artists they consider art to be both the most promising platform and the most likely instrument by which the fusion and mutual complication or disturbance of traditionally discrete knowledge fields will succeed in affecting significant and increasingly urgent cultural and behavioral change. Um, so in terms of change, we're talking about climate change, uh, they ask what exactly change means in the context of crisis, for example, mass extinction and the Anthropocene, to consider and practice art as a tool of disruption and mediation, how passivity might subversively be channeled as a weapon, and how complex cross-disciplinary relationships can effectively and otherwise be productively managed in the cultural sector. As a consequence of their approach through many projects, the artists have invested and directed their energies towards alliances and conversations across multiple fields and exhibitions, <coughs> associated seminars, and international conferences. So for them, for this uh, productive <coughs> duo, every exhibition made is a provocation of sorts, which we can talk about, uh, and is used to create opportunities for extending discourse, often between people who would otherwise rarely, if ever, engage with uh, such materials or uh, exhibitions for that matter. <clears throat> so over this time and as a consequence they've exhibited and otherwise continue to be involved with many other internationally significant artists and theorists uh, worldwide. Now in 2019 they continue to develop ongoing projects in Rhode Island at the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University and in Alaska at Anchorage Museum. Brindis Snigorn's daughter is professor and MA program director at the Iceland Academy of the Arts, and Mark Wilson is professor of fine art and course leader in MA Contemporary Fine Art at the University of Cumbria Institute of the Arts UK. That's my intro, and I will pass it back to Mark now, and then afterwards we'll, we'll have some discussion. Thank you very much, Ward. Thanks everyone for, for coming today. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I have to apologize um, that I'm just one person. Um, we're supposed to be two people. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Brindis, just through some mishap, is unable to come. Um, but she regrets it <coughs> and um, has it entrusted me to um, communicate about the collaboration and the, and the project. So 
bear with me. Um, thanks for the introduction, Wood. Um, that's that just about covers it, I think. Uh, but I'll, I'll flesh it out a bit. Um, so the context for this talk is the Visitations Project, which I think it was on the um, introductory um, text on the poster. So I guess most of you have seen something of that. Um, it's a current project which will be a three-year um, enterprise starting, where it starts this year. We've been working on it pretty much since uh, January. Um, and uh, we, we, it'll be going on for the next two years. Um, and I guess in, in my, the, the introductory or the first third or half of this even, um, I'll be referring to that project and, and associated, an associated project in Alaska, as we point out. Um, so throughout the talk, extinction is probably uh, more implicit than explicit, but uh, clearly present nonetheless. So um, please, uh, the other thing is, do feel uh, free to just in intervene or you know, butt in to ask a question, raise a, raise a point or whatever at any point. I know we're going to have a Q&A at the end and stuff, but I'm very happy for it to be you know, um, a little bit more flexible than that. Um, so the scope of the talk is visitations. Um, you may get to trap fishing in America and other stories, um, which is a project we did in Arizona uh, in 2000, 2014, 13 to 15. Um, and then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the only show in town as well, which is the show that Will alluded to there, um, which we've been doing in Providence, which actually is over now, but it was, it was exhibited uh, Two year project, I guess, and the show happened in April through to July of this year. Um, okay, so, so um, I'm giving you a little bit of background to the, the kind of methodologies or the thinking behind the work, uh, which is kind of relevant to all the projects we do. Does everyone, anyone hear me okay? Everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and so these are things that I'm sort of going to be touching on either directly or implicitly again, uh, things that are very important to us. This is Brindis, who mm -hmm. uh, sends her apologies. Um, and uh, so site specificity is something that's of great importance to us, um, and site responsivity. Um, and that is no accident in the sense that through that we can get to things which aren't particular as opposed to generic. And so, the importance of the particular is very important in our practice. Um, and by that I mean the idiosyncratic and the, and the you know, so-called aberrant thing that is um, in sense embodies the characteristics of something individual as opposed to something tokenistic or something which is you know, generic or which stands for many more things. It's about that particularity which, which we find very useful. Um, so I can talk about that a little bit as well. Um, the foregrounding of process, the search, the, the finding out is really important to us. Um, and that, yeah, so, so I'll talk a little bit about that at the outset, actually. And um, hybrid methodologies, cross-disciplinary appropriation. We work a lot with other people. We collaborate, maybe that's too strong, but we, we, we use negotiations and conversations with people from different practices. It's not, it's, it's so, where we are very firm, firmly and clear about the fact that we're artists and we do art. Um, because of the nature of the, the things that we're kind of working with, which are to do with the environment, with the ecologies, or in the broadest possible sense, um, we, we, we tend to find people within this, in other disciplines who have skills and knowledge that we don't have. Um, because that way we can, we, it just seems to be a very, um, rewarding and, and uh, effective strategy to do that. And maybe that will become, how, quite how that works out will become a bit more evident as well. Um, so we, we really enjoy extending discourse between ideological or dis disciplinary strategies. Sorry, strangers. Um, and by that I mean that most of the exhibitions we do involve either in a serial way or, or a, maybe sometimes just one big kind of thing that happens in the exhibition, which might be a seminar or a conference or something. Um, we like to involve people who wouldn't normally speak to each other in the context of that particular exhibition. So that's the kind of strategy that we, we deploy 
um, which is which is kind of um, interesting, um, but it's very much in a sense another instrument of, of the practice. It's not something that's like an add-on. It's something which is where the the exhibition, the artwork, becomes a mechanism by which something else happens, some other conversation happens that would otherwise happen. Um, so the only show in town, that's the, as you know, the title of an exhibition, but it, the only show in town actually just means like the only thing that really is worth talking about right now, which is, the, which is environmental collapse and climate change, all those are consequences, geopolitical and um, geographical and uh, environmental consequences that we are beginning to get a, a sort of conceptual handle on, but which, um, um, for, for which there are no real political answers yet. Um, and they're not, you know, the one's in a hurry, in a sense, to um, turn that into the most, the most um, hot uh, social topic, um, which is extraordinary, but, but it is happening. 19, uh, 2019 is, is um, a year definitely when the conversation has changed for all sorts of reasons, for Extinction Rebellion and, and, and many other <coughs> bodies and, 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 and protests. And so things have changed. It's a talking point in the news, which it wasn't last year, curiously. I mean, and I've been thinking about it, we've been talking about it, and I'm sure everyone's been talking about it for years. Why isn't this happening? So I think it is a year to happen. Um, we work in a context of crisis. Um, art is a tool of disruption and mediation. Passivity is an instrument of resistance. Talk a little bit about that. And the approach of the idiot. The idiot that's, that's a reference to Isabel Stengers. Some of, some of uh, you will have come across Isabel Stengers in um, that particular piece, The Cup of Political Proposal, which is a good read. Okay, um, I shall now move on. Um, so, first of all, how can passivity be or be made to be? purposeful or a form of resistance. Passivity, in the sense intended here, is a concept that in art brings multiple perspectives into a presentable form. A line of sight by which we examine how conditions and materiality coalesce, uh, coalesce bringing situations into being, and how such situations are constituted and exist in fluid complexity in time and space. Passivity is, is anti-militancy, uh, anti-evangelistic, anti-iconic. Uh, anti but what is not made conspicuously visible in a way by which it can be named can appear in another way obscure, paradoxically beyond identification, and remaining hard to notice, a condition compounded by the vicissitudes of mutability, mutability change. Change is the one thing by which all conditional elements in one way or another, at one pace or another, are related and equally diverge. So such work <coughs> might appear obscurantist, um, contrarily obtuse. So is this a deliberately and self-destructive dissolution of possible effect? Or can passivity, the strategy to favor complexity over the iconic or simplistic, be redeemed in a reframing towards purpose? Does it inevitably lead to, uh, for, for instance, irony in presenting a leveling of antithetical moral positions? Ought we to know from the outset what that purpose might be? Is it just a nudge or a spur, really, towards behavior, behavioral change and a consequential slowing down to accommodate an ever-shifting kaleidoscopic view, thereby prompting a measured relational sensibility over one otherwise insistent and a jumpy semiology of fixed abbreviations. So we are talking about semiotics. I'm, I'm conscious of the slight irony of this, because this, this was an extraordinarily iconic show. Um, it was a very early part of our um, uh, collaboration. Um, <laughs> so, but actually, not only, you are talking about semiotics, but actually of how art can disrupt our semiotic addiction, pointing us always to specifics rather than the generic. So fudging disciplinary boundaries, the matrix of lenses by which we consider our multiply constituted subject, in turn will tend to deepen and extend this complexity, demanding a slower, more worldly, knowing, sophisticated engagement. 
In discussing the trope of artist's placements in societies of the other, in a text called Other People's Cultures, Ravel Buchler rightly cautions that the more we, that is, artists, overlap in our work with the, with the practices of other fields, and the more we trespass on others', others territories, the, the clearer and more specific <coughs> we need to be about our specific, uh, specialist identities and roles, that is, as artists. Detournement is known as a familiar artistic form of culture jamming and semiotic guerrilla warfare. Detournement uh, re radicalizes previous critical conclusions that have been petrified to respectable truths and thus transformed into lies. It's, it's a classic uh, artistic trope uh, to hijack some, some behavior or some, some model that exists very often in another field entirely. Um, and take it somewhere else, or to subvert it, or to, to do something else with it, to repurpose it. So artists, Buchla says, are in their behavior generalists and have different motivations from those specialists in other fields. But it is their responsibility to pay more than close attention to the specificity of the processes and presentations, and in presenting a richness of material in the form of propositional, non-directional, associative tangentials in art. There is an inevitable liberating effect as we tra track between conditions, objects, and relations, rather than simply <coughs> words. The words are simply one more material uh, in our practice, and in turning to art, we allow ourselves, that is, artists and audiences alike, to be cut adrift from the tyranny of unitary symbolism. So for us, in considering how we use and abuse representation, particularly through images, we reference the inflated expectations and reliance we, as a culture, um, have on images, and make a rationale for multi-stranded and interstitial constructs as mechanisms by which to draw meaning from the particular rather than the generic. Increasingly, images on their own provide us with a flattering, uh, reflective screen rather than any roof to understanding, uh, understanding of phenomena or really relations. This is because our understanding is diverted by images rather than enabled. Unmediated images, that is, images untroubled by other strands and inflection, suggest independence of subject and closed narrative, destinations rather than a way, icons rather than relations. And now more than ever, in terms of an environmental crisis, we need to think image, we need to think, we need to image and imagine relationally rather than in the misleading terms of reductive and implicitly finite meaning. So, as I say, the, the collaboration began with this piece. So I'm looking for this, yeah, this project, which this, of which this is only one part. I'm not gonna talk about this project. Um, but it was in lots of ways, it was very complex in itself. And, and, uh, I mean, the, the key thing about this for us, although it was interpreted in lots of different ways um, by the national press at one point, who saw it as entirely an environmental um, critique of some sort. Um, but for us, the, the, the key thing, the key motivation, uh, was to give back to each specimen, each polar bear specimen, Took we found 30, 34 in the UK, the British Isles. Um, to give back to each specimen, each specific cultural history, from the moment it was captured or killed up to the present day. So, so it was really to take apart this, to, to, to strip it of this role of being a, a token of the Arctic or a token of polar bearness or whatever and to actually do the research and find out what, you know, how each polar bear came to be in some kind of collection with the private public in the UK. So it was about finding that, that history. Obviously, we, we, we couldn't find anything about the, the time before that capture or kill, but um, that at least was some way of, of giving it back this specificity. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, this, is, this is, yeah, the, the reason I'm including this text is, uh, is uh, a quote from um, Maurice Blanchot. Um, as I've indicated from the beginning of our work together, the process of research and inquiry has been key, not only in finding out and scoping a promising approach, but also in the presentation of our work to a public. In the space of literature, Maurice Blanchot talks of making of the work a road toward inspiration or knowledge. 
and not of inspiration eroded toward the work. We are advised them not to seek in order to find, but to use the possibility of finding, even the inevitability of finding, as an impetus towards searching. Um, and I think that it's, it's kind of important in her work that we reveal that process that, that, to, to the audience. It, it's, and we find different ways of doing that, and, and some of those will be commended, I guess, in a couple of projects I'm going to show you. But um, yeah, that, so, so it, it's not just simply about producing something which, there are two things go on really. Most, almost all the work we do is installation based, it's, uh, which is, in a sense, the dynamics of that, as you'll know, is, is it's, um, it's based on a, sort of a dialogue between elements within a space. So there are several elements within the space, <coughs> they talk to each other, and the art is like in that space between those objects. And one of it is the agency that those have, but the multiplied and compound relationship that they engender. Um, but part of that is, in a sense, an exposition in some way of, of the process of making work. Um, so our current project, Visitations, is an artist-led three-year international and cross-disciplinary project made possible by Iranis, which is the Icelandic Research Fund. As artists, Brindis and I are privileged to lead this research team comprising ethnologists, folklorists, and the curation project which is hosted by the Icelandic University of the Arts. In association with the University of Iceland and with stakeholders, Akureyri Art Museum and Anchorage Museum in Alaska and the Research Centre in Australia, Iceland. So there's, there's three sites in Iceland where it's specifically kind of talking to or from one another. Um, and then there's uh, Anchorage Museum too. Um, it's, it's, great, it's great to have, to be working now with, because we have gotten used to kind of working with scientists and stuff. And there's always this thing where it's really, some, some people working in science are just fantastic. And some, a bit fantastic in terms of they kind of get it and they get what you want to do. And there isn't a sort of difficulty, there isn't some awkwardness. But sometimes it's difficult to find those specific people. So that's excellent really work. In this project, we're working with folklorists and ethnologists. And so, or ethnographers, and so in, in a sense, it's um, there's a kind of the element of um, not the fictive but the mythic you know, within this project, and I think that's a really interesting place to be working from at this at this stage. It's certainly very exciting, and, and it's a great team. To, everyone's very much um, very active on it. It's, it's good. So the aim of the visit of visitation is to contribute to a growing body of knowledge concerning <coughs> human non-human relations and habitat in a time of global warming and rising sea levels. To this end, we draw a particular focus on historical and contemporary polar bear arrivals to the coast of Iceland. This particular animal is found increasingly either out of place or out of time or both, <coughs> not only in its arrivals to Iceland, but it also in its detainment each autumn, for instance, in Arctic Alaska for increasing periods due to late ice formation. Where historically in Iceland the bears would make appearances in greater numbers during particularly harsh winters, and usually on ice, they now arrive less seasonably predictably by swimming. These changes provide a point of focus for us to gauge historical and contemporary conditions of difference, and thereby to imagine opportunities and imperatives for human behavioural adaptation that further environmental change will inevitably enforce. So in visitations we're looking in a critical environmental ecological context the concepts such as stranger, hospitality, and cohabitation. By foregrounding the animal as foreign, quote, and through the study of its multiple other guises, such as a being, a cohabitant, a visitor, a register of environmental change, a remnant, an artifact, the project aims to make a significant contribution to current discourse on the objectification of both human and animal others. Um, and particularly in, well, in, in relation to borderless environments, and as such, to offer an alternative understanding of both environmental and geopolitical ownership, behavior, and response. The changing story of, bear, story of bears coming to and living in proximity to humans demands new sensitivity and consideration of far wider implications, interspecifically and across the world. 
and a new, and new responses and behaviours regarding migration, hospitality, dominion, property, power and respect. So the full title of the, of the, the project is Visitations and the subtitle is subtitles, Polar Bears Out of Place. So let's stop a moment and listen to the words again, uh, out of place. And you recognise, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, Mary Douglas's words, impurity and danger, famously talks of dirt as much out of place. What is aberrant and out of place troubles our culturally informed senses of order. An established sense of order, held in place by systems that sustain it, allows us to maintain focus on things other than survival, to lower our guard and to press ahead with an agenda that needs no longer look to right or left, to reappraise or reconsider. For centuries, a polar bear coming to Iceland has troubled the Icelandic way of life. There are associated records, myths and stories of these arrivals, um, going back 500 years, actually. More recently, there's, there's data and reportage, of course. A comprehensive accumulation and new ordering of information will form the basis of a visitations database on which we will all, all the team will be drawing on uh, during the life of the project. So while in, other, while in other northern communities the arrival of polar bears is simply a mark of the cycle of seasons, as I've said more recently, <coughs> their presence in proximity with humans is extended year on year because of the annual delay of autumn ice formation. But because of their intimate nature, it's difficult to imagine the arrivals of polar bears on the shores of Iceland as being anything other than an aberration. Uh, both for us, the hosts, and for the polar bear, the visitor or the guest. For us, actually, to meet would be an encounter both of the rather the voyeur. The stranger arriving at the shore is exhausted and in need of food. How should we respond? Of those over 500 arrivals to the shores of Iceland, the human response has been to snuff out the threat embodied in the bear. Bears, when detected, have been in one way or another, and without exception, it seems, eliminated, most recently and typically by shooting. But we live now in a changed and changing world, and that change demands that we consider our responses to events in new ways, ways driven by something other than anthropocentrism, human or cultural convenience. Sea level rises across the further effect of this global warming, and we are very familiar now with the practice of scientists using models to estimate probabilities in respect, for instance, of climate change and its localized constant, uh, its local, sorry, localized coastal consequences, geographically and geopolitically. So, but artists also make models, driven sometimes too by data, but by the, also by the accumulation of stories and collective experience, and in turn by the imagination to test behavioural alternatives, alternatives, for instance, to such historical and legitimised responses. The changed world, particularly one which we as a species have changed, have changed ourselves, demands not only new responses from us, but also new ways and new evaluated ways of estimating what these responses should be and telling them to what ends. Models or artworks in this context can easily be seen as contemporary, a contemporary kind of storytelling. So this research considers stories and their historical absorption into the cultural imaginary, the history and folklore of polar bears in Iceland. But as a contemporary art project, the research also provides the basis for the development of a new model, new stories or proposals as instruments by which to think things differently into being. This is a dis the, the, the closest distance, it's something like 200 miles. But it, there, there are over those 500 years, there are uh, records of these, of these animals appearing, actually all of them, most of them, predictably uh, on the north coast. Um, I'm going to get to some art in a minute, I promise. Um, in the light of all this, in order to triangulate uh, the idea and potentials of visitations as evidence in the Iceland research, Bridget and I have drawn um, in on our ongoing research as polar lab artists in residence for the last few years at Anchorage Museum in Alaska. Anchorage, of course, is uh, down there, yes. Um, in this work, we have consulted and gathered material from field biologists uh, from the US uh, Geological Survey and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and during this time made new works for two international group shows at the museum. We've also gathered accounts and perspectives of those living and working with the polar bear and its habitat. This linkage is key. There is no polar bear as we know it without the conditions that determine its evolution. The abilities of species to adapt to new environmental conditions vary, 
and for some such adaptation may be possible for others. For us, this emphasis on locus, this intersection of polar bear and disparate human interests together with this specific place is for us a site. And it is this kind of complex and contested site that is pivotal for the development of our work more generally. In other words, how a site is constituted by all manner of you know, locus, uh, environmental conditions, social conditions, weather, temperature, um, configuration of place. Um, in fact, anything just that you can identify as being the, uh, yeah, the constitution of, 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 of a local, a specific ecology. Um, but the site as described well, is also a place of environmental change in which rising sea levels determine a depletion of bluffs against which bears can dig new dens. So from this intersection, stories spill and ripple out, causing incalculable complex wave disturbances. On our most recent trip to Alaska, just over a year ago, we spent 10 days in Kaktovik, in Alaska's North Slope Borough, which is the, the red pointy thing there. Um, we were hosted there by the performance artist Alison Apukachuk-Warden. And crucially, Kaktovik is the only human settlement within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the, otherwise known as the Anwar. In light of this experience, we're examining in more, in more detail the complexity of this contested and highly sensitive habitat. I'm going to stop reading shortly. Uh, since 2017, the idea of drilling in designated areas in the, the Anwar, that's the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, seems to come and go and come again. Uh, some of you may be aware that Trump, um, the uh, American president, has um, uh, you know, signed, signed off uh, permissions to do this again back in December 2017, I think, which caused you know, just yet another um, outrage, you know, and it's just one more manifestation of the way he's sort of suppressing um, the, the project, the work, and the, um, even the, uh, the profile of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, but it, it's, so it, it comes and goes, and, and it's an ongoing tug of war between the desire to extract the fuel and commerce, and the perceived need to conserve and protect the fragile ecology. The extraction of oil in this area is contested both on a local level and at an international level. This particular story brings particular site specificity to a conundrum witnessed across the world, ultimately a showdown between the hubris of perpetual growth based on the extraction of fossil fuels and the imperative to arrest global warming, and more generally, the decline in environmental health. The existing oil industry on the North Slope Borough works across the land of the polar bear and building ice roads during the fall, which in the process must circumnavigate any discovered dens by a radius of one mile. Should a den be discovered or noticed even when an ice road is already being made, uh, or sorry, already made, it must still be rebooted or supply routes otherwise rethought to comply with this condition. But in Kaktovik, there are, as I suggested, other stories also at play, notably those of conservation, tourism, and the people for whom, along with the polar bear, this land is home, the Inupiaq. So there's one dynamic. We have the, the oil thing. Then we have conservation. Um, through the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, through the, 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 the use of the uh, ANWA, the uh, wildlife refuge, um, they protect challenged and endangered populations from decline. And to that end, they apply restrictions on local communities that inhabit traditional hunting practices on caribou, on the polar bear, and other species. Tourists, on the other hand, come to this city. It's a population of 300. Uh, this is it. Um, but, but it's referred to as a city. Um, they, they come, tourists come to observe the gathering of polar bears. Um, as they wait for the formation of the ice. But in so doing, they are said by locals to take up valuable and limited seats on planes, preventing or inhibiting the flow of provisions, um, and the flow of mail, and medicines, and the transit of locals to Fairbanks and Anchorage for medical treatment. So we, as I said, we were up there just, about, just before this time last year, and um, we spent a long time talking to, to folk who were saying that um, this is a real problem. And, and people have been uh, 
utterly compromised in terms of health and in terms of just their, just their living by tourists who come to see polar bears. Um, this is this has been this, this particular place has been called the polar bear capital of um, Alaska, but actually it's probably the place where most polar bears um, gather on a regular basis. Um, and so sometimes you can see up to say, 60 polar bears on one spit of land. When we arrived there, there was we were told immediately, "Oh, you won't see any polar bears because um, everyone's got so pissed off with the tourists that." Uh, the, they've now put these the whale bones, which they, they actually feed the polar bears to keep them out, largely to keep them out of the, the village, with um, whale bone carcasses. Um, usually just one whale, actually, um, each season of, of two seasons. And, um, but they've moved on to native land so that I mean, tourists can't get to it. And so while we were there, it was a really curious thing because it was just at the moment when the tourists were up in arms because they paid thousands of dollars to get there and they couldn't go and photograph. Um, but, so it's a real sort of standoff, and, and quite understandably. The, the objection is that there's no sort of interface, there's no interest in the community, there's no interest in, people just fly out, snap, fly out again. So yes, the Inupiat community and Captain Pig are caught in the matrix of these intersecting interests, along with the imperatives of their own traditions, ambitions, and needs. Predictably, there's no one community view on any, any of the above. Uh, on oil, conservation, tourism, hunting, or indeed the polar bear itself. It's been a custom now, though, for some 40 years or more, for the whaling captains to, to do this thing with whale bones. Um, and one interpretation, beyond sheer good sense, is that there is a, a behavioral ad adaptation. They used, they used to hunt polar bears, now they, they, do, they treat polar bears in a different way, because the subsistence hunting as such they do is, is to, more to do carry them than to do whales. Um, and so, they, in a sense, they, they, they look after the population of polar bears and wait for the, you know, the later and later ice to form. Shortly before our arrival in Kachavik, um, this, this, this problem um, had arisen or it had reached a, a head. Um, and so there was, a, there was a real issue. Okay. This is the view from our. Um, the place where we were staying. And so we could actually see, you can see that bears out on this bit of land. But most of them were out where the whale bones were, completely other side. So, for the first show that we, uh, we participated in Anchorage, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of work now. Um, in Anchorage Museum, we looked at uh, these factors, this, sort of this, this matrix of intersecting human intersecting and, and uh, in a sense, non-correspondent uh, human interests. So that's the oil, conservation, tourism, and, uh, and local people. Um, our association with the museum began in 2015. Curiously, it was where um, we were giving a paper to a quinquennial art and environment conference in Reno, Nevada, of all places. Uh, and we made reference to a project we've been working on notionally at least since 2010, but in which we had some difficulty in uh, and maybe that, to some extent, was to do with the fact that we were working with scientists up in uh, Svalbard and Spitsbergen, and we weren't meeting the right people. But actually, that's quite understandable because up there, the 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 bear populations are out of sight and a long way away from anywhere. Um, and the the big thing, the important thing, is to try and keep people away from it. We certainly, if you if you move outside of Long Long Beer, Long Beer, you have to carry a gun. Uh, and the last, and if you carry a gun, it means you've got to shoot something, right? You get prepared to shoot something. So it would have been a pretty stupid thing to like turn up and shoot a polar bear. So we were quite happy to just work with and talk with people that uh, actually were in that, that town rather than looking for for polar bears. It's not it wasn't our ambition to do that. But the interesting thing was that the, the reason we were on this particular track. Of, this thought um, was because we um, had because you know you, you've seen the kind of spectacle that Nanak flag and Bluesome was and it was a, a stunning thing it had sort of ten polar bear specimens in Spike Island in, in, in Bristol but it, it was kind of a bit iconic it was a bit of a spectacle and kind of we felt a little uncomfortable with that in some ways it was a very successful project in many ways. 
But the whole idea of that spectacle, in a sense, was counter, counterproductive in terms of where we were going with this. Um, and so we thought about what it, what it would be like to instead examine a void, a space, which was somehow um, charged with meaning. And, and so we, we had, in the course of doing this kind of thinking this way and doing the research we'd done, um, thought that the, the, the polar bear dens are quite extraordinary things, but are potentially, um, in fact, that everyone is, every single one is unique. And, Sometimes they have like one cavity in the entrance, sometimes they have you know, multiple cavities. They, sometimes they're, typically they're about you know, six meters long. Um, they're only dug as maternity dens. They're, they're dug simply for, to, to, to actually, um, for the female bear to be pregnant, to go into a state of almost hibernation, and then for the, for the, um, the young to, to be born. And, to grow to such a condition that they can leave the den. The males don't, uh, don't have them. Um, but this, this idea of this architectural space, which they can modify, and they, they, they are known, um, certainly by some sources, they, they are thought to modify these according to temperatures. Um, so really unusual, really, or rather really useful to think of, this idea of this space, which, um, you know, because the polar bear has this sort of you know, notoriety as being the sort of flawed um, icon of the Arctic and stuff, and the, uh, the icon of the environmental decline and all that sort of stuff. And so it is, it is really problematic. Um, but if instead we can reconfigure this as a space of possibility, and sort of and actually consider it concentrated on that instead, it, it was much more interesting to us. It, it felt like we had much more much further to go with that. Um, so, these are drawings that were made that we, we found by looking at it we, in Tromso. We found these drawings and stuff in the, in the, uh, the, Polo, the Polo Museum, the Polo Science Archive there. These were dens that were drawn up in um, something like uh, the late 80s, actually, um, where it was a big thing to go and measure all of their dens and, and to measure their particularity, their specificity. Um, and so we, we began to make. Um, to make uh, some visualizations of these things, um, just to see you know, what, how it would be as a, almost as a piece of sculpture. Um, these, these are the kind of snow bluffs I was talking about before. These are actually quite elevated. They're, they're kind of on a, on a mountain. Uh, not, I mean, not super high, but nevertheless quite an elevation from the sea. The problem in Alaska is that a lot of these sea bluffs are quite low, so the rising sea levels, they're completely compromised. So there's, there's going to be fewer and fewer places for them to actually find to dig snow dens. Uh, the um, so I'm working with two machines here. Uh, yeah, so, so that, was, that was just using um, you know, computer-aided technology. We just, we just work these into three-dimensional things. And then we began to plan how we would actually construct these things. So when we were in um, when we were in Reno in Nevada, we were approached at the end of our presentation where we talked a little bit about this project in, in the start. Um, we were approached by the director of the Anchorage Museum, which is why, why this relationship was sparked up. And so we began to go there, been there a few times, and we talked to people from the US Fish and Wildlife there, um, the US Geological Survey, and they gave us a whole bunch of drawings which had been made some time ago of specific dens. In that environment. Um, and so we began to work with, with these things with an idea of making, making these um, objects. And we thought that the appropriate way of, of working with these or making these things would be in glass. Because you know, to make it like a so, so in a sense you privilege, privilege the possibility of seeing inside it being Of course, you know, polar bear doesn't have um, a contour other than an interior contour. It's not something that exists out there, out in space. And so that, so that it just seems to be the most interesting way of doing that, attacking that particular problem. So this is, this is a kind of way of manufacturing, which is in the National Glass Museum in, in, um, in uh, Sunderland, actually. And uh, so this is a, a method called um, lab work. And it's basically just blowing glass, just blowing sections 
where you building this thing up. Uh, so that manifested as these objects here. So what you're seeing here is when you look down on, on one of the pieces that we did, it would be that. So um, you'll see it's on a cliff, and underneath, from the inside, there's a the video projection on that surface of um, reconnaissance across the North Slope Borough. Uh, using fixed wing aircraft usually. Um, and it's called, it's a, it's a system called uh, forward looking infrared. So they go out at night um, uh, and, they, and they scan the landscape. It's not at night actually, but they scan the landscape um, and they, they pick up any sort of sign of warmth in the landscape. So they're looking for these polar bear dens. So the, the technology of the oil company is being used in order to locate polar bear dens, which if found, Will then cost the oil company billions of dollars. So it's a really interesting sort of intersection of those dynamics and human uh, interests. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, so you get, so this is a moving image behind the glass, and what happens is that the, the, the green light from the, the film flickers up and refracts through the glass object, so it becomes animate you know, as, you, as, you observe, as you approach it. And then you can hear, the, inside the, the, uh, the plane, you hear the sound of the, the, the people talking to each other in the plane as they're sort of spotting things or not spotting things. So it's, uh, it's very much a kind of mashing together. Um, was one way by which we, we found to, uh, to mash together these, this idea of these conflict of interests. Um, in the background, there's a whole bunch of this is up in Barrow, um, these photographs of um, basically just um, summer houses right on the, right on the point of Barrow, just before the end of the, the most northerly point of the US. Just exactly a whole collection uh, out on spit of land of just summer houses where local people are there just going, they, they sort of hang out. But there's a, this great sort of temporary nature to these buildings, they're sort of ramshackle structures. Um, and there was something about the impermanence of that which we thought was interesting in relation to the, the polar bear dance too. Um, so a piece like this was something like that sort of size. It was the tenth size of, of that particular den. That was a seven meter den. Um, there was one that was an 18 meter den um, from Svalbard, not from Anchorage. So they, uh, they go pretty crazy sometimes about making these things. Um, so I just, I, yeah, I wanted to come to this piece next. Um, or not. Yeah, so, uh, so this was, this was in Captain Obviously you can see that they don't, you know, it's not something they take for granted by any means. I mean, it's part, it's part of the culture of being there. And it's increasingly part of the culture of being there. This, this weird proximity where, and as far as, as far as we can make out, every, everyone told us that there'd be no, um, actual sort of fatal encounters. No one could remember if there had ever been any fatal encounters, which is a really extraordinary thing. Uh, they do for the wandering streets. There's a, like, there's a patrol that goes through the town and, uh, each night uh, just to see you know, if there's any around and what they want to do. In, uh, so this is back in Iceland. And you see there's another sort of graffiti thing going on here. And this is at a site where, this is one of the sites we've been investigating. Um, and as I say, there is a, a host of, of places um, which we can, which we can, we will, will be looking into more closely and talking to people uh, about these very different kinds of encounters where instead of being uh, lived with, these animals are uh, shot, basically just to be extinguished. Okay, so, so once detected, they're wiped out. Uh, there was an extraordinary uh, opportunity that, um, that uh, we had in 2008. Two polar bears came to the north of Iceland in the summer, and uh, we were in um, in, the, in the, the country at the time. And when the second one arrived, and we drove up north, and um, basically we were access, press access to as close as we could get 
to this poem, and everyone could see it and stuff. And there was this big debate, and the Ministry of the Environment went up there. So she was there, and there was this big hoo ha. What are we going to do? Because the tradition is to not think about it, even, but just to shoot. Um, and so this went on for many hours. Um, to the extent that a, a cage, a crate, was devised and, and sent all, certainly sent over from Copenhagen Zoo. So you can imagine how many hours this took. Um, with the idea, this was the radical idea, that somehow something else could be done other than eliminating this, this creature, um, this, this being. And so uh, it all kind of looked quite positive, and the idea that perhaps they could tranquilize it instead of killing it, you know, that would be interesting. Um, and then at the last minute, the most extraordinary thing happened. They, they, they couldn't figure out, they decided they couldn't figure out whether it was from Iceland, from, from Greenland, the Greenland population, or whether it's from Svalbard. Um, which, you know, in the, in the uh, east. And so at that point, things became very complicated because the idea that it might have a, a, a kind of uh, bacteria or some kind of infestation, some kind of problem which would be then introduced to another population became a problem. And so while all this was going on, the bear turned around and started walking back towards the sea. I mean, they're knackered, you know, when they get there. I mean, it's, it's a long way, you know. And they might have floated the first part of the device, but the rest of it is swimming. These creatures can swim like 60 miles a day easily. Um, and 